Let me begin my remarks by expressing my sincere thanks to the World Government Summit and also to the Ministry of Finance of the UAE of being our partner on this important session on the role of tax policy to drive global growth, prosperity, and climate action. <laughs> Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, tax policy reforms during the past three years have been dominated by COVID relief, climate action, and the G20 OECD international tax reforms, notably pillars one and two. Hopefully the worst of the pandemic is behind us. However, so many challenges also are ahead of us. Inflation, higher interest rates, recessionary risks are all challenges that we might be facing in the coming period. Those challenges do threaten the global and the regional economic recoveries. One of the issues to address those challenges includes reshaping of the international tax architecture to improve inter international tax rules in a more transparent tax environment, principally through the G20 OECD two-pillar solution. One of the landmark reforms include a global minimum corporate tax rate set at 15%, which is now estimated to generate more than US dollar 200 billion in additional tax revenue annually. Within this in mind in 2023 and beyond, the international tax agenda should reform, um, uh, should refocus on what we can achieve in, in, in terms of the sustainable development goals. The interconnection, cre the interconnection creates a unique foundation of support to drive further tax reforms regionally and, in global, and globally to promote national and international investment in a sustainable way and benefits, of course, all of us. This session will focus on three issues. The first issue, looking beyond COVID and refocusing the role of fiscal policy to achieve the SDGs, especially number eight, which is decent work and economic growth and number 17 partnership for the goals. Second issue that we will focus on this session is on implementing the G20 OECD pillars one and two, assessing the challenges and opportunities while balancing revenue needs <coughs> and the investment climate in developing countries. The third issue we'll be focusing on is the role of tax policy and green financing to support SDG number 13, climate action, including investments in renewable to support a just energy transition. To address those issues, I have five panelists who needs no introduction. I have on my left, His Excellency Yusuf Al Khalil, Minister of Finance of Lebanon. I have also Mr. Yunus Al, -Al Haji Al Khouri, is the Under Secretary of the UAE Ministry of Finance. Ms. Catherine Baer, she is our partner at the IMF, who was also with us on the physical forum on Sunday. I have also Pascal, who has been with us in the last two years on, on those sessions. He's the former director of OECD Center for Tax Policy. Last but not least, Daniel Witt is the president of International Tax and Investment Center. Let me start our discussion with an update on the status of the inclusive framework re reforms known as Pillar 1 and 2. Pascal, I'm starting with you. You have about seven minutes, please, on this issue. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And good morning uh, to you all. Thanks for the invitation. Extremely happy uh, to be here uh, in Dubai for this uh, very important event. Um, 
I, I, I will try to share with you where, where we are and where we came from as regards uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 to, to see what's, what's next on this agenda. Noting, as, as you said in your introduction, that I'm the former head of tax at the OECD, so I speak even more freely now uh, that uh, I'm no longer in charge. I, I took on an advisory role in communication in a, in a private firm, Brunswick, and I will be professor at uh, professor of tax policy at the University of Lausanne in, in Switzerland on the way forward. So uh, I speak still on, on, I mean, with my previous hat and, and my new hats. Um, as you've just said, one of the defining issues of international tax has been this uh, OECD G20 agenda on Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. It, it comes from the uh, aftermath of the global financial crisis. We, we need to remember uh, since the 1920s, there was an international tax framework uh, made of very little interaction between tax sovereignties except for tax treaties. And, and this system proved extremely good for investment and so, but probably too good to be true for companies because they were able to reduce their tax burden in a way which was not compatible with the objectives of the international tax framework, which was to eliminate double taxation and not to facilitate double non-taxation. And as a result, the G20 took on that work in 2008, 2009, and asked different organizations, including the OECD, the IMF, and others, to fix the system. And uh, this is what has been done for the past uh, 15 years. It started with the end of bank secrecy, which means tax cooperation, and it was uh, prolonged by the um, uh, BEPS agenda, you may remember, in 2012, fighting base erosion and profit shifting with a number of, of measures. These measures patched the system but didn't completely fix the system. And that's why there was an ongoing conversation following the delivery of the BEPS measures in 2015 with, um, in 2016, the establishment of an inclusive framework for BEPS implementation to level the playing field, to bring all the countries on an equal footing, which I think is extremely important to move away from the imperialism of the OECD as it was in the 90s, where the OECD decided for the rest of the world but didn't implement the rules for itself, that, that, that there was a change. In 2017, there was also a very important event, which is the US tax reform. I'm mentioning it not for the sake of doing history, but for you to understand that Pillar 2 actually is the legacy of the US tax reform. And that's very interesting because the US tax reform was done by the Trump administration, the Republicans in, in the Senate, and, and the Republicans in the US are not big tax lovers. I mean, they're not like a Frenchman who's suspicious of being a tax lover, right? Uh, the Republicans in the US thought that the rate was much too high, 35% of corporate income tax. They reduced it to 21%, but they had to broaden the base. And to broaden the base, they introduced a global minimum tax, the global intangible low tax income, I mean, it's a funny name, right? Guilty. Uh, even the Republicans thinking that too low tax burden is guilty, in a sense. And they established this global minimum tax. And at the same time, they reflected on whether there should be more taxing rights at corporate income tax to the market jurisdiction. At some point, the, the House even voted what they call the destination-based cash flow tax. And this is not only for history books. It's, it's a very significant move by the US, even though the Senate didn't pass it. But they started reflecting on changing the fundamentals of the corporate income tax. I'm mentioning that because it explains what happened next, which was Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Pillar 1 is a way to redistribute taxing rights, to say not only the digital companies have been able to locate their profits in places different from where the consumers are, but all the companies, from Louis Vuitton, uh, I remember the French finance minister Bruno Le Maire saying, I want to tax Google in France, but I wouldn't like the Chinese to tax Louis Vuitton. Actually, it's the same issue. Who has the taxing right? And I think there is now a recognition that markets should get more taxing right than just the country where the in intangible property is booked. And Pillar 1 is about that. It was agreed on the 8th of October 21 as part of this uh, historic deal. Uh, there is the decision that 
a company should be taxable in a country even if it doesn't have a permanent establishment in this country, and a quarter of the rent defined as above 10% profitability should be allocated to the market jurisdiction. That's the agreement which was reached and which is now being discussed in terms of implementation. The difficulty of Pillar 1 is that you need a multilateral convention to overcome all the bilateral tax treaties in their definition of the arms length principle, which doesn't allocate uh, in, with an apportionment method a quarter of the rent to the market. It's a transaction-based method. Um, so there is a need for a multilateral convention for that and for overcoming the definition of the permanent establishment. The difficulty with a multilateral convention, which, by the way, has to fix a number of technical problems like the rules to eliminate double taxation or how you can improve tax certainty, which is badly needed in this new environment, is that you need ratification by the parliaments of all the countries and there is one specific country in the world, we all know it, which is the US, where, because of the Constitution, uh, the executive cannot commit the legislative branch. So there is a big uncertainty, and actually more than uncertainty, will 67 senators ratify a multilateral convention? The answer, given that bipartisanship in the US is broken, the answer is no. So you have a risk here that a number of countries will take unilateral measures uh, to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, in other words, digital service taxes. As regards Pillar 2, which is extremely important for this country, right? Uh, pillar 2 is the continuation of guilty. In other words, putting in place a global minimum tax. The difference between Pillar 2 and guilty, the main difference, I would say, is that guilty was calculated on average across the world, you would look the effective tax rate of a company abroad, all countries confused, while the Pillar 2 provides for looking at this on a country-by-country -country basis for companies above 750 million euros of revenue. That's the agreement, and we need to keep in mind that it's an effective rate, it's not a nominal rate. Effective meaning that you take the financial consolidated data and you look at the tax effectively paid or accrued. If it's below 15%, then it triggers the fact that the country of the headquarter of the company will, in, will include this income in its tax base, that's the income inclusion rule. But if this country doesn't do it, the source country can do it. And that's the under tax payment rule with a, a, a key to share the taxing rights between market jurisdictions, which is being worked out. But there is, and I'm finishing with this because that relates to the United Arab Emirates, uh, you have the possibility to do a top-up tax, a QDMTT. There are too many acronyms there. I'm not responsible for this one. Uh, but it's a top-up tax. You may decide to take the tax yourself. Otherwise, somebody else will eat it up. So you want to do it yourself, or you may want to do it yourself. And, and if, you, if you do it, I guess 15% for the in-scope company is the right thing, but it raises the question of, uh, do you put in place a full corporate income tax system? And, and there are some slight difference between a QDMTT and, and, and the full corporate income tax. So in, in a few words, this is where we are. It's defining and it's happening. Maybe the last words are about the implementation. Pillar one, a negotiation is taking place. It's a hard negotiation with all the technicalities, but with the prospect that it's not going to work immediately. Now, it will not work immediately. There will be unilateral measures. There will be trade sanctions. There will be trade tensions. And given the state of the world, which is fragmenting, these trade tensions in the Western bloc, are not necessarily great, and at some point, I think the US will come back to the table and will agree something along the lines of Pillar 1. But there may be some turmoil between now and then. Pillar 2 is happening. A number of people were doubtful because the US didn't really implement it with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. They did a minimum tax of 15%, but in the US, which is not equivalent to the, the Pillar 2, and Europe took more than one year to implement. Hungary and Poland objected to it. Finally, they lifted their veto, and Pillar 1, the income inclusion rule, starts on the 1st of January 24. 
which is in less than a year. And the under tax payment rule starts on the 1st of January 25. And with the European countries, the block of 27 countries, you have the critical mass of countries in terms of multinational companies in scope, in terms of market, which will trigger all the other countries implementing. We can see that in Japan, we can see that in Canada, we can see that in the UK with Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, being a big fan of this minimum tax and his predecessor being wiped out because of too lax tax policy that she wanted to implement. And you can see Indonesia and you can see many emerging economies moving. And to finish with the United Arab Emirates, you're moving, uh, you have a rate of 9%, which is another part of pillar two, which is an, an, a, a subject to tax rule. But keep in mind that 15% for the in-scope companies is, is the rate which other countries will implement. Switzerland, where I'm now I'm teaching, is changing its constitution to implement pillar two. So you can see this was defining, this was fundamental. I think we've turned a page of the international tax framework. I hope it will stabilize now on the basis of these two pillars, um, but implementation will be extremely important. Thank you. Pascal, thank you very much on this illuminating background. And every time I hear your story, it refresh my mind of this whole history of the new reform of tax regime. Let me now turn to Catherine, who will uh, provide comments on SDG number 17, which is Partnership for the Goals. Catherine, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm on mic. All, everyone can yep. hear me? Great. The first thing I'd like to do is thank you very much for inviting uh, me as representative of the IMF to share our views. Thank you to the Ministry of Finance of the UAE. It's a great honor to be here. And of course, Arab Monetary Fund, our partners in crime, in organizing the Arab Fiscal Forum and, and several events. And my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, Pascal, the Minister of Finance of Lebanon, and my friend from, from Washington, Dan Witt. So it's really a pleasure to be here this morning to share views. And this is a really pretty important point that you ask uh, about uh, not only the SDG, but how can we intensify and ensure collaboration uh, in, among all of us? To, to work toward the SDG goals uh, in terms of cooperation between the different entities at the international level who are working to support our member countries uh, in their tax reform uh, efforts that we know it's, it's a big challenge and there's a lot of work to do. So part of this landscape, I should say, but certainly not all of it, is uh, the platform for collaboration on tax. Um, and many of you may have heard of it, but many of you may not. And uh, so let me just start by defining what it is and what its mission is, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're actually doing. I'm representing the IMF at the Platform for Collaboration on Tax. So what is it? It's a joint initiative of the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, the UN, and the World Bank Group to strengthen collaboration on domestic revenue uh, domestic resource mobilization. So it's focused on this topic. Let me just read out the mission because that will also give you the framework. The mission of the platform, or I'll call it the PCT, Platform for Collaboration on Tax, is to support countries' efforts to improve revenue mobilization by leveraging the expertise and experience of the four partner organizations, each with their own mandate and policies. The PCT offers a platform, that's why we call it a platform, right, for the partners to collaborate in developing guidance and tools to assist countries with tax system reforms, focusing in particular on environmental taxation, international taxation, and medium-term revenue strategies. I'll come to defining what that is in a minute. The PCT also enables dialogue and information exchange on revenue mobilization between the partners and promotes broad stakeholder engagement. So this mission statement reflects the, the platform's pretty unique purpose, which is to serve as a mechanism for exchange and collaboration among the four partners in their efforts to support tax system reform, particularly for developing countries. So let me tell you a little bit about 
what the program has been focusing on, what the platform has been focusing on in these past two years, so the 2022-2023 program. So the platform is focusing on three priorities. Tax and the environment under the tax and SDGs, tax and SDGs work stream, international taxation, and medium-term revenue strategies. Let me tell you a little bit about the work the platform is doing in each of these areas. That'll give you an idea of what the platform does. So there is now a, a tax and environment expert subgroup. This is dealing with environment, climate. Environment, uh, the UN prefers to use the environment to go beyond climate to talk about issues having to do, for example, with uh, uh, forestry, health effects of climate change. We're focusing here more on climate and tax. So there's a tax and environment subgroup with representatives of the four partners that regularly get together to talk about the work that each of us is doing uh, on climate. Uh, there was a paper that was prepared, for example, comparing each of the partners' carbon taxing approaches carbon pricing approaches, excuse me, which is important because each, body, each organization has a slightly different approach to the carbon uh, pricing uh, issue. Uh, there was also a blog and a, web, a webinar to disseminate the results and messages of the paper. But this is uh, available uh, on, the, on the website. There was ex externally available information. And then there's a twice a year meeting with the uh, partners that are in the technical working group and the subgroup to discuss the type of work that we need to do going ahead for the member countries. This is a relatively new subgroup. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about the work on international taxation, which is, as Pascal uh, mentioned, uh, you know, one, it has been one of the focus areas of work of the PCT, and I would say probably one of the reasons why the PCT was, was established to begin with, right? Not only do the countries have to collaborate, but those of us assisting the countries need to be on the same page in terms of, you know, what we're saying and how, how we're helping them. Um, so what do we, what do the platform do? It provides help on a, on a number of areas, but especially on providing countries with toolkits. Uh, for example, the toolkit on tax treaty negotiation was updated in uh, May of last year uh, to include uh, PDF and online versions, new resources, sample texts, and examples of typical treaty provisions. This is a toolkit on uh, tax treaty negotiations. There's another toolkit on the taxation of offshore indirect transfers, and uh, there were a series of ask the, ask, ask the Expert webinars that were held uh, in uh, 2022 to, to provide answers to country authorities on the issues of uh, the taxation of offshore indirect transfers. So not only the toolkit, but <clears throat> an exchange with country officials who would like to understand how this should work and how they should can apply the toolkit in this area. The PCT is, uh, we're closely, uh, closely monitoring the developments in international taxation and identifying areas that may require further collaborative work. There's been discussion of the possibility of developing supplementary guidance on the impact of Pillar 2 that Pascal just described on corporate tax incentives to enable countries to assess the efficiency and effectiveness of their incentives, re incentive regimes to support investment. And the PCT partners are exchanging updates on the progress made by the UN Committee of Experts on Tax Matters particularly on UN standards such as the taxation of income from automated digital services. And this is sound a little bit technical, but these are the specific texts that deal with this issue. Article 12B of the 2021 UN Model Double Taxation Convention between developed and developing countries. So the PCT will continue to, con to disseminate technical guidance in the toolkits through its website, dedicated webinars, and under the Ask an expert series and also e-learning modules. So a series of activities to support countries in this area. Let me uh, go next to the third sort of leg of work of the platform for collaboration on tax, which is the medium term revenue strategies. And some of you may know, but others not, the medium term revenue strategy approach 
was really something proposed under the platform, by the platform for collaboration on tax. And the idea is to help countries uh, re design and implement medium term, so four to six years, revenue, uh, revenue strategies that consist of tax policy measures, tax and customs administration measures, and tax law changes that are required not only to make the tax system more modern, robust, um, and uh, uh, able to withstand uh, shocks that are continually happening in the world economy, uh, but also to be specific regarding uh, the revenue objective of the government. Under a medium-term revenue strategy, how much does the government uh, hope to generate in terms of resources uh, with this strategy? Is it 1% of GDP over the four to six years? Is it two? And where, are the, where does the revenue come from? Is it from policy measures? Is it from administrative measures? And according to which one, what are the legal changes that need to take place in order for these policy and administrative reforms to be put in place and have the desired effect? So in, in sum, this is a medium-term revenue strategy. And the idea is to help countries also coordinate the help that they're getting from different partners since they now will have a plan or a more clear structured idea of the reform program, and also to be able to engage government, for example, uh, uh, Pascal mentioned parliaments, uh, to improve the, this line of communication between the executive and the legislative branch, between the, the different agencies within government, if we're talking about broadening tax bases and addressing incentives, for example, and also civil society, to have a broader and more open engagement and discussion between the government, civil society, and the private sector regarding the tax policy and reforms proposed. So it's a big, if you will, it's a, it's a big plan, but it's one of the first times that uh, we come out bringing together a lot of the strands, a lot of the aspects of tax reform that many countries undertake, but they're not usually under one umbrella to make this plan coherent and specific. So what is the uh, platform doing to, to help countries design and implement their, uh, their medium-term revenue strategies? So that we're conducting workshops and events to serve as platforms for developing better appreciation of what this is, medium-term revenue strategy, and its four components. Uh, as an approach for undertaking comprehensive tax system reform, organizing exchanges on experiences in formulating and implementing the uh, MTRSs in countries that have already embarked on this kind of reform, sharing the progress countries have made uh, with an uh, update on the website on what each, where each country is, and collating publicly available resources on the MTRS. So in the, in, uh, the PCT's December 22, 2022 progress report lists 22 countries at various stages of, this, of the process of formulating or implementing a medium-term revenue strategy. In the MENA region, the countries that are considering, e either considering, designing, or implementing uh, a medium-term revenue strategy include Egypt, Jordan and Morocco at different stages. Egypt, Pakistan, and Rwanda have made progress in their medium-term revenue strategies and have advanced to the stage of implementation after finalizing their strategy. A few new countries, such as Maldives and Sierra Leone, have embarked on an MTRS and are receiving IMF support to formulate it. Uh, some countries have not used the MTRS in such a formal way, but have used specific aspects of it to advance uh, tax policy or administration reforms. And examples of such uh, countries that are doing it include Indonesia and Thailand. Um, so in addition to the, uh, I'll give you an example of the webinars that the PCT organizes. Um, uh, PCT collaborated with the African Tax Administration Forum and the Asian Development Bank to hold three regional workshops on the MTRS, which provided a, a number of countries, more than 50 governments from Africa, Asia, and the Pacific with a platform to exchange information on how this approach can benefit their tax system reform in the face of the pandemic. This took place during the pandemic. Recently, the PCT also held workshops for an exchange of views uh, and experiences for countries that are already doing the reforms, including Egypt, Rwanda, and Uzbekistan. Uh, 
So in addition to these three major areas, the platform also has activities relating to other SDG-related topics, for example, tax and gender. Uh, the PCT partners raised awareness on the role of taxation in promoting gender equality and growth through a joint blog, a paper, and a public workshop. And there is, I should remark, considerable work being done by the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, and the OECD on how t tax systems can be designed to promote women's uh, labor participation uh, in the workforce uh, and to recognize the different needs of women uh, in the tax system and also in, their inter in our interactions with the Tax and Customs Administration. This is a very, let's just say, hot topic right now, and there's a lot of interesting work going on. One other area where the platform is working together is on resilience and preparedness for shocks. Of course, we all know that this is such a shock-prone world. And the PCT partners shared cutting-edge knowledge, resources, blogs, and policy papers on tax policy and tax administration responses to COVID-19. There's a lot of information on the website on COVID-19, specific uh, responses on, from the tax side. And there's also work that's going to be ongoing uh, to support countries' responses to other crises, such as conflict, fragility, and other economic shocks. So the, the work on that stream is uh, less defined, but the PCT stands ready to focus on including specific country experiences that might need uh, a concerted effort from the four partners. So finally, let me just uh, also tell you a little bit, because for those of you who don't know this, there's a very good website, the PCT website. It serves as a global resource on international taxation uh, for tax officials from countries at all levels of development. What is there on the website? There's a resource tab on these tools and frameworks that I've been referring to. There's an MTRS resource page that describes what the MTRS is and the countries that are undertaking or embarking on such reforms. There's an e-learning calendar of the partner's tax-related courses. And last but certainly not least, and this is probably the first time we've ever done this, there's an online integrated platform that is a database of domestic resource mobilization activities and projects of all the partners in every country of the world. So if you log on to the OIP, the online integrated platform for a given country, say UAE, you will see all the technical assistance a specific capacity development and technical assistance activities that are going on uh, for all four partners, um, OECD, IMF, World Bank, and the UN in the UAE or any other country. And this is a very rich source of information uh, for those working in this area. I think that I will wrap it up with that. Okay, thank you, Catherine, very much for informing us about all those efforts, and I think this website I'm sure it is very beneficial for those who are interested to know about the developments and what goes on in different countries. Now, let me turn to Mr. Al Khalil, the Minister of Finance, and thank you for being with us. You know, I, we understand your busy schedule, and I want now to go to the implementation part of this tax reform. And if you please may brief us on what would this global tax reform in terms of impacting the ability and it would be good if we focus on our region, our ability to attract um, international investment in a sustainable way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, really. And uh, thank you for the two presentations, uh, Catherine and Pascal. Very educating, and I need to be educated on that, you know, to the politics. I'm an economist, but I'm learning every day more and more. Uh, hopefully, that will aid my, uh, um, uh, the success of our administration on that. Uh, and I like uh, the two parts in your question. The first part is that, uh, you know, ever since 2019, we've been living very, very hard times. And those hard times, uh, if you wish, increased in, 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 in endangering the, the system if, uh, and uh, increased our uh, uh, difficult times into uh, uh, executing our responsibilities. Um, now, we're listening to you too, uh, I, uh, I, I realized, you know, what used to be said about coming 
late uh, into a program or coming late into uh, a system or coming late into executing a policy because you tend to learn from other people's experience. And the two presentations were very, very well given. I already have ideas that I would uh, share with you. Uh, now, we, we are, for the last year and a half, We've been working with less than 40% of our, uh, if you wish, uh, 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 human resources. We've been working, we, you know, all of our, uh, if you wish, uh, work in last year was executed with zero access to electricity. Zero access to electricity. Uh, was executed with no ACs, with no light, with no... Uh, 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 means of interacting with, with other institutions that were very, very useful when we succeeded into interacting uh, uh, with them. So we come from this background, and uh, I have, uh, it wasn't my intention, but very often I would invite my uh, visitors to come see our building and how we work. In. And at one time we went into an upper floor where I found a lady working in a, in a context where there was no longer a wall because of the blast of the, and using uh, a candle and her cell phone to, for electricity. Uh, wow. <laughs> and that was 10 in the evening and a lady on her own in this kind of a building to tell you how useful are women and what kind of an input they can put if you, when, when participating into a program. Uh, now we are coming to in, uh, into a context uh, where decarbonization uh, uh, is at stake and is uh, the name of the game. Uh, in my mind, uh, uh, decarbonization stands very close uh, um, to digitalization. And I think when executed in the third world countries, would have to go together and would, would strengthen our means if the target is that. Uh, uh, um, so this is the context in which we work. Now things have gone a bit better, a bit better as far as resources are concerned. In certain instances, it has gone so good that we asked for one, uh, if you wish, uh, 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 technical person, and now we have all of a sudden five or six governments and agencies uh, proposing to fill the gap. And we very politely telling them we don't need six, we need one or two. So don't be frustrated if we sit together and try to pick up, uh, given what, what our needs are, uh, uh, the, the, the right person and the right person. As far as policy, uh, uh, the, the, the head or uh, uh, the title of our policy would be, you know, uh, um, how to attain a single currency. People who work on Lebanon are very often frustrated that you have five or six, uh, uh, if you wish, uh, exchange rates. Uh, and we come and uh, very proudly saying we have five, you have in the States have one. Uh, but it has helped, and it is time. It is time to get out of that system into unifying uh, 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 the, uh, the exchange rate, uh, uh, if you wish, uh, curve. Um, what ha very close to uh, taxation? It is taxation. And the, uh, we started by imposing new prices on our custom duties. It was not able previously to generate income easy in Lebanon because of so many things having to intervene and uh, to impose certain rules that are not appropriate for the present time as far as policy making is concerned. So we spent, I don't know, maybe eight months, nine months uh, uh, into a very difficult dialogue with people who were making money very, very easily, too easily, with a lot of power. Uh, uh, political and others, but mainly, mainly not political, mainly having to, to, to go with corruption. That can be endorsed by other uh, negative forces, but uh, it's not, uh, we don't want to discuss it today because I have very limited time. Uh, 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 so it has worked, it has worked a lot, a lot. Uh, and you know, today, uh, uh, you have some kind of, you know, on the, on the, uh, misinformation you can put in the system into the dialogue which in Lebanon and in many third world countries, developing countries, 
politics and economic uh, analysis do not go uh, do not go pair. You know, do not are not very efficient. So you can one can lie a lot on the system, on the regime, or what have you, uh, 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 without having the adequate kind of uh, information. I would love to criticize the system. I would love to improve, improve. I would love us to go out of this crisis, but with the right information. And one is political, one is, uh, 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 if you wish, uh, the produce of many, many years of no economic discussion in the country. And second, we don't have access to a reliable information. You know, we still work in 2022 uh, statistics. Uh, uh, so this is one very important aim to undertake uh, to uh, have the access to the uh, right information. Our uh, adventure uh, with the uh, uh, custom duties is that we finally got it. And now our aim is to increase it so that at the end of the day, our custom duty uh, uh, exchange rate and our market exchange rate are the same. Uh, now they are so different that it, it encourages a lot of, uh, uh, if you will, uh, um, distortions uh, in, in the system and all kind of arbitrage. Now the arbitrage has decreased. Why has it decreased? Because the custom duties rates have increased and are closer than before with the market rate. So learning by doing. And, uh, and, and this is, this is uh, working uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, fine. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to take this opportunity. I'm really sorry to tell you that we expect aid from all of you. And of course, once we convince you that this aid is being to be invested in the right place and would be, if you wish, uh, 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 applying uh, uh, the necessary economic rules of course, there is not one economic rule to adopt, but still to have to be closer to to to, to right ways of doing uh, things. Um, I liked a lot, uh, seeing what you said about the medium-term approach. I think we need a medium-term approach. We cannot afford in Lebanon a long-term approach because we know so little about the statistics, and we are in a hurry to do something today. Our first 2022 budget was an emergency m budget, and we tended to call it us and the market, the emergency uh, budget. Now we have to go more into the structure, more into the efficiency, more. Uh, uh, we have a problem, a very important problem uh, uh, in Lebanon uh, that one side of it is very positive, uh, uh, which is uh, the private sector. The private sector has been doing better and better over the several the few, few months as far as income is concerned, as far as growth is concerned, and as far as salaries are concerned. The public sector has not followed because the, the Lebanese law, okay, business law, does not permit increases into the income of uh, 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 employees uh, uh, in an easy way. It's almost impossible uh, until you publish your, your, your new uh, cabinet, uh, if you wish, work. Uh, so the private sector is doing well. The public sector, which cares about th 300,000 people, most of them uh, uh, armed forces, and only 14,000 are, you know, uh, employees in the government. So you need to feed those 300,000 people, very frustrated. You need to supply uh, 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 for education, for health, and what have you. More than 60% 60 60 of our uh, budget goes on salaries of the public sector, of the military. We need the presence of the military at the same time. You cannot tell them, no, we cannot help, because things can go, can go uh, 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 in, the, in the wrong direction. Uh, some authorities, international authorities, are assisting in that, but it's never enough to pay. 60% is a lot, <laughs> uh, uh, plus 15% on electricity. So what is left for you? Okay? That's why we want to work on the medium, long t on the, the medium term uh, and get as much as possible support and abilities to take things to the better, not to the worse. We cannot afford staying where we are. Things are moving very fast. Mr. Minister, thank you for your transparency. I believe this is a step in the right direction to identify challenges 
in order to move ahead for attracting an international yes. investment. Uh, let me turn to you, Bukhalid, on, on the highlighting the tax reforms taking place here in this country, in UAE. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, start by expressing my thankful uh, to Arab Monetary Fund and IMF to make our participation at the World Government Summit a success. And this is uh, really an opportunity to address the World Government Summit today. Uh, the UAE has made uh, SDG a fundamental part of its vision and, 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 and future plan, making them part and an element of its 2030 agenda. These goals have been incorporated into the, uh, the development strategy of the country as a whole. A national co committee on the SDG has been established. And, and within the UAE, there is a process and a procedure to engage stakeholders, relevant stakeholders have to be engaged, building action plan, monitoring the progress it, it made, and submitting a quarterly report to the cabin, uh, uh, presenting the achievements or the challenges that these entities are, are, are meeting, and to ensure that these goals are aligned with the vision of the 2021. From the tax perspective itself, as we all know, the UAE has introduced uh, an excise tax back in 2017, uh, and, and the, the, the scope of the excise tax was to include the e-cigarettes, sugar, sweetened beverages, in addition to carbonated drinks and tobacco products and sugary and energy drinks. This policy has been formulated and, and part of the UAE process itself to have a periodical review that uh, uh, was uh, periodically introduced through cabins or, or uh, amendment to the law itself. And the key purpose of the uh, uh, excise tax was to reduce the consumptions of unhealthy and harmful commodities therefore promoting overall sustainable well-being of citizens and residents of the UAE. Then the, the VAT was followed in, in January of 2018 to make the continuous enhancement to the law itself with a view to increase flexibility for taxpayers. One of the most recent significant change inclu in, in the, in included a reduction in penalties scheme itself. Uh, the, which provides a 70% discount on penalties that met certain conditions. As, as we are all aware, uh, and since uh, last year, the UAE has also introduced a CIT, or corporate income tax. The policy of the corporate income tax is based on pr principles of neutrality and transparency, which is in line with the UAE overall vision and principles. Position has been taken to apply targeted uh, exemptions, which includes the entities that do not compete with the private sector, given their contribution to the social fabrics and the promotion of economic welfare in the country. Thank you. Khaled, thank you so much. And last but not least, Daniel, for this first round. And Daniel, I believe you are celebrating your 30th anniversary, and I. Thank you for being with us and for being a partner with the AMF to um, identify challenges in this region and help us on different workshops and capacity building. But looking beyond COVID and thinking about refocusing fiscal policy to achieve SDGs, what do you see the key supports of the SDG number eight uh, decent work and economic growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great pleasure for ITIC to be on this platform with the AMF and in the room with Mr. Abustani and His Excellency Al Khoury, the, the brain trusts of, of taxation in, in the UAE. Um, in, in Pascal, let me begin by congratulating you on your successful tenure at the OECD. It's a pleasure to be back here with you. We were together last year. Um, there is no doubt that the OECD and the G20 under your leadership has changed the world 
of tax. Um, there is no question that thanks to your efforts, the behavior of taxpayers, especially multinationals, has changed. When you started your job, when we were together in, in Doha in 2010, it was beyond crazy to think that companies would publish their tax strategies. Um, no one even knew what was a, a tax transparency report. These are now on most of the Fortune 500 websites. Now, the challenge, I think, for you in the public sector is how do you utilize these? You know, how can you use them to drive forward a risk-based approach to manage your revenue administration? So those may be some things to think about for future capacity building with OECD and IMF. These are new tools. And those good actors should be rewarded by having a risk-based approach and a more cooperative approach. And I think the result of all of this is that domestic revenue bases are more protected from some of the abuses that BEPS sought to stop. They have stopped. And the result is more revenue, especially flowing to the developing world. Now, what do many investors and many tax administrations want and need now? It's been a whirlwind pace. Some degree of pause is needed to focus on implementing, not just pillar one and two. I think there's still a lot of work from the original, BEPS 1.0, two, to invest in human capacity and three, to digitalize your tax and customs administrations. And last week I was in Cape Town at what I understand is the world's biggest mining conference. Saudi Arabia had the biggest exhibition um, and I chaired their first ever tax panel. They never thought about tax before, but it was clear that both sides, the investors and the governments want stable, simple, transparent, predictable, no surprises in their regulatory and tax regime. Nobody was begging or crying for subsidies, special privileges, or tax holidays. 20 years ago, that would have been the theme of the day. And the tax administrators that joined me on the panel, and you can see the diversity South Africa, Zambia, and Mozambique, each expressed a commitment to having a cooperative approach with their large taxpayers and wanted to avoid disputes on the front end. And there was a clear understanding on the need to build trust, confidence, and mutual understanding between taxpayers and governments. And, and it may sound cliche, but you are partners, your development partners, your climate change partners, and your partners to deliver prosperity to your people. And let me just focus now, Mr. Chairman, on SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. And it's important to remember the sequence of economic activity, investment, employment, tax and development. All too often we sit at panels like this. In fact, happy Valentine's Day. I'm thinking of Valentine's Day in 2018, the first PCT conference at the UN in New York. And we talked about tax and development. And I said, wait a minute, we need to move up the supply chain. And it reminds me of, of one of my favorite quotes by the former chairman of Citibank, Walter Riston. Capital goes to where it is welcome and stays where it is well treated. It was true back in the 70s when Mr. Riston said it, and it's very true today. Thank you.